Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Find Your Resilience with myself, Vanessa Gellin. And on today's episode, I have a very special guest, Dr. George Ackerman, who wants to share his story of, you know, his mom's legacy, who passed from Parkinson's in hopes to spread awareness. Dr. George Ackerman, is it okay if you introduce yourself to our listeners? Sorry, I really appreciate your time and your listeners. It uh, means the world to me to have the opportunity even for a little chat. It's a very important topic, Parkinson's awareness. Uh, unfortunately, my mother passed away on one one twenty twenty due to the disease, and hopefully you know, we'll get more into it. But my journey in life today is really to help find a cure for others. It might be too late for my family, but it's not. Uh, Parkinson's really affects about 1 million people in the U.S. and 10 million around the world, so it's really shocking. Uh, my background, I always say it's not important because it's really, I'm here for my mother's memory, but I have a background, and it's kind of ironic, but I was uh, uh, first became an attorney in Washington and Florida, then I became a police officer, and then I did my Ph.D. in criminal justice. So my whole life I've actually been an advocate for victims of crime, uh, specifically, my dissertation was on aiding African-American mothers who have lost their loved one due to crime or murder in West Palm Beach, Florida. A lot of the time, the family members become victims of uh, not just society, but the criminal justice system. And I equate that a little to patients and caretakers of Parkinson's disease because uh, there's no laws or really any protection for their rights or support. And we're trying to change that right now in the United States. Oh, wow. Thank you. You're a jack of all trades. Yeah. Um, I always say I wouldn't be who, the man I am today if it wasn't for my mother's sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So let's just jump into it, George. I mean, it sounds like you loved your mom very dearly and she meant a lot to you. So tell me about your mom. And, you. Um, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. I know I also I mean, I lost my dad to cancer back in 2020. So I understand Already. grief. It's tough. And everyone, you know, everyone's grief is different. So if you could just share your story about your mom and, you know, how you've dealt with grief and, you know, spreading awareness about Parkinson's. Sure. Uh, right now, we're actually entering an important time in history. Last December, the first act in U.S. history was passed through Congress called the National Plan to End Parkinson's Disease. Oddly enough and shockingly, there's never been anything in U.S. legislation before last December to help uh, support individuals that have Parkinson's that are diagnosed. It'll help caretakers. It'll help really bring equality to the different locations and different races so everyone has an opportunity to be seen by their doctor. But the reason I brought that up first is that this year, 2024, it's going to the Senate. So it's really, uh, in a way, cool because all your, awesome. yeah, because you and your listeners and viewers and whoever's listening and sharing this can actually contact your own uh, uh, United States senators. So if you just write them, call them, tell them you want them to support this bill that's coming, it'll change the world forever. And this year, 2024, will be historic. I'm hoping to actually be at the uh, Congress when it happens, hopefully. But uh, it's really big time stuff at this time. But my mother was very independent. She was very friendly, dedicated. She was a school teacher and gave up her career to raise me and my brother. So that's why I always say I, I don't think I would have. She was always standing next to me, whether it was law school graduation, the police academy, graduate, every step of the way. She was the first person I called for advice, for good or bad. And uh, she was just someone, she's not just reliable, but loving and caring. We used to fight about every Sunday what we're going to order for dinner. <laughs> so I look back now thinking, why would we, you know, that was dumb at the time, but I miss those times. She also has, I have three kids, and she loves spending Sunday mornings uh, blowing bubbles and coloring books with her grandkids. And those are some of the things that hurt my heart today because I walk by my backyard, and because of Parkinson's disease, we're not able to ever uh, relive those things. Uh, those are the things that really stand out. But Parkinson's is tough. It's a neurodegenerative disease to the mind. And we didn't have as much research as we do today, 10 years ago. But it was just watching any loved one like you. I send my love to and support to your family due to cancer. I wish we had a you know, cure for cancer or every disease. But uh, so, you know, watching a loved one go from very strong, living alone, independent, to kind of the last few years going to a cane, then gradually to a walker, then to a wheelchair and the bed bound. And something that you sit there as a caregiver 
and you really feel sick, uh, you feel stressed and drained, and you just look for everything you could turn to. We tried everything, like seven doctors, uh, therapy, this and that, and I look back and I can't regret anything because if we had it over today, I wouldn't, there would be nothing different I could have done. But it just uh, really, I use the word, and it sucks, you know, to have to go through it. My mother was a young 69, and I always find in 2024, I'm not sure how old your dad was, but I feel people should be around till 85, 90, uh, and it's just, you know, ter terrible. Yeah, I know my dad, he passed. He was 61, so he was in his 60s. Yeah. For your mom, you said, was she diagnosed at 69, or she passed at 69? Yeah, for 15 years. Oh, and wow. the thing with Parkinson's, it affects everybody so differently. So every person, you know, you speak to that might have Parkinson's is a completely different scenario. Some people can live. They say you don't die with Parkinson's, you die with it. But it's different, again, for everyone. We don't know if the medication didn't work. Maybe there was too much medication. It's just so complicated. I'm not a medical doctor. So we actually hired, we were lucky the last year, she had a nurse, a professional nurse come over to help uh, make sure we're following things, but we also had to hire, and we spent a lot, like 12000 a month just to have some, a caregiver. I mean, they call them caregivers. They were really more like babysitting, just so my mother wouldn't fall when I couldn't be there, but I was very involved. I mean, I was only 10 minutes from her house, so she needed something I would rush over. The worst part of it is, towards the end, she got uh, dementia, too, and dementia is really frightening because it, you get delusions and hallucinations, and those are very frightening because your loved one now thinks they see people who aren't really there, animals who passed away, she thought were in the room. And, you know, she would laugh about it, but it was really uh, heartbreaking because you don't know, you know, you, I never lied to my mother. When she asked, will she be here for my daughter's wedding, I couldn't lie. So it was just really not being able to answer questions was the worst part of it. Well, thank you for sharing that. I know that takes a lot of vulnerability to share and it's never easy especially when you're talking about a parent um and for my listeners for those who don't know what parkinson's is, is as george was mentioning it is a degenerative um disease it affects the non-motor and motor systems and you can see symptoms as it affects the motor with like tremors rigidity you have that shuffling gait did she have those symptoms yeah she had them all except she didn't have the external tremors like michael j fox if you know he's a very famous mm -hmm. celebrity oddly enough uh, my dream is coming true on february 2nd i'm going to orlando to meet michael j fox so i've been like that, that awesome. was a uh, lifelong dream and right now i'm actually in a boot because i had ankle surgery but i'm oh. not gonna let you in our life, you only get one opportunity, like Eminem says, one shot. I'm not going to miss up that chance. So even if I have a few seconds, I'm looking forward to that. How did you get that opportunity? That's well, awesome. I get, I'm not a big into the comics and things, but I guess once a year they travel around the country and they have this uh, big mega con, like comic thing, and he's going to be promoting Back to the Future. Oh, I might be the only one there talking about <laughs> Parkinson's awareness, but I'm hoping to give him a ban and remember my mother and just t thank him for all he does. I work with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. We help raise funds for them. Uh, my website, togetherforsharon.com, we do not accept money. I don't do any of this for money. I, uh, I just do it for a passion to helping others. Uh, you know, this I started the website because when I was a caretaker, I was completely lost. I didn't know where to go, where to turn. So we put all the resources out there for free on one website. But I realized a few months ago in 2023, last year that uh, it's not just about my mother and me anymore it's about everybody so in the last four months i've interviewed over four or five hundred people around the world from uh, italy to spain to africa to i mean you name it canada i even had iceland and i interview people who have parkinson's people who have foundation and people who have things that are actually trying to fight the disease like uh boxing for parkinson they have golf for Parkinson's. it's amazing how many things they have but people just aren't aware so uh, I decided to do that, and I kind of finishing up, but it was really an honor. If you go to the website and click interviews, somebody, uh, uh, your viewers can share their journey. But every morning I wake up, it's inspiring. I see another story, and it, that's what really gets me to keep doing this. And uh, it's really, I actually was able to interview Muhammad Ali's daughter, a lot of uh, yeah, inspirational oh, people who are uh, you know, just changing the world, and I just want people to be aware the only journey I don't know about is the one that, again, breaks my heart because I feel that there's just so many people out there that are not heard 
And in our, our job, even today, if we just reach one person that realizes that they're never alone, then I feel like we've made a big difference. And uh, one person is funny, told me a few weeks ago, they went on the website and were reading articles and uh, journals for 10 hours. And I told them, I, you know, don't waste the whole day, but it was really amazing feeling knowing that it's reaching so many people now. And, you know, it's just a great, we have our own podcast now. I have one with three people with Parkinson's. So this is the first unique thing out there. I've never seen anything like it where we bring caretakers and people with Parkinson's together and just have a talk about awareness. And it's really uh, also for the first time next month, we're starting through a big organization called PSP Awareness. They're uh, helping me start the first ever in my view because i've done a lot of research uh, support group so it's for everybody who's lost a loved one due to any disease so it could be cancer and it's a free uh, time once a month where everybody's just welcome to join me and we'll get to know each other it's private it's confidential but it's really needed because i didn't have any of that when i was going through this. oh my i mean you're creating a large impact yeah. and um you know you're turning, <laughs> you're turning your pain into a purpose what <laughs> I mean, it sounds like, you know, you didn't have those resources, so this inspired you to create all of this. But I guess tell us about the journey with Together for Sharing. I mean, you Thanks. you kind of listed a lot already. Yeah, I actually just started it really to remember my mother and to tell my little journey. I thought maybe a few people would see it. And then just over the years, I kind of left it. And then this last year, I just got inspired. And again, I made a few friends on like Instagram that have Parkinson's. And when I see what they're going through, it like uh, kind of kills me and I, I don't sleep. Even last night I was up all night just thinking of ways to reach people because I find that it's, I love the Parkinson's community, but I need to reach individuals like you and your audience because if we don't get people who don't have Parkinson's and people who are not Parkinson's caregivers involved, we're never going to find a cure. If you see with COVID how fast, you know, they were able to come up, not with a cure, but at least a vaccine uh, I feel that if we had more mouths and more people working together, we already would have had a cure. My mother would have been right next to me. Uh, it's really tough, especially on holidays. You know, if she wasn't here, we just celebrated her fourth year. I don't know if you call it celebration, but at least a remembrance. And it's, you know, it's crazy how it's only, it's been four years. It feels like sometimes it's been a hundred years ago and sometimes it feels it was just yesterday, but I'm actually finishing my first book on the topic and that'll be out, I hope this year. And uh, what I did is I really, I kept a journal. I never shared it with anyone, but a written one. I took pictures and video, but I don't want her to remember like that. But I actually am going to share all my intimate feelings and my rage and anger and sadness throughout the last year of her life. Uh, and you'll see the struggle. But, you know, we come out on top of it. Again, I lost my mother, who is my best friend. But I've made so many incredible people like you and your audience who inspire me and keep me going. So... You know, that, uh, also the website, it's togetherforsharon.com. Again, I don't accept money. We have a donation area where people can actually donate to big organizations like Michael J. Fox, Parkinson's Foundation, and my family, along with donations in the last four years, raised over $11,000 for the American Parkinson's Disease Association. So it's pretty cool. They have, a, you know, it's a website. You click from my website. It says memory of Sharon, but it literally goes to them. So I don't have to deal with the taxes or the accounting because <laughs> I don't want anything to do with that. So it's mm -hmm. uh, you know it's a great opportunity. There's resources. Our podcasts are there. I have uh, another podcast with my wife. So it's real, we're doing one today where we interview individuals in the Parkinson's community. It's called Together, uh, Together for Sharon podcast, and it's a conversation like we're doing. But it's cool to see uh, people like seeing the female perspective. There's not a lot of males, I find, that are doing this in caregiving, but bringing us together, it's really interesting to be able to, you know, hear both perspectives. So the website has that. Also, it just has a lot of resources. It has our journey and what, uh, you know, what Together for Sharon is and what it means to me. That's, wow, that's incredible, George. You're inspiring Thanks. me right now. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> so, I mean... For those who don't know, I am a psychiatric nurse practitioner, and I know you Hello. mentioned so many emotions that, you know, you <laughs> want to include in your book. But tell me, I guess, being a caregiver for someone, you know, your loved one that's, you know, sick can be stressful. How were you, I guess, taking care of your mental health or like, how was that for you? By the way, if you email me after, I'd love to share your journey, too, because I don't just cover Parkinson's. I also want to really bring out cancer so maybe 
we could talk after because I think sure. it's very important. For, it's not just the game. Yeah, we're all family in this fight for all these uh, diseases. And uh, But to answer, go back to your question, it's not easy to answer because, I, I, again, I don't think I do anything different, but I definitely did suffer. I mean, I work a lot 24-7 as a professor, a lawyer, and a cop. But I also have three kids and a family. Luckily, my mother, my wife was a huge support. She uh, very loved my mother. They were also best friends, which is all really great. Because a lot of times I hear funny stories that in-laws don't get along. <laughs> well, I was really gifted with the, the they were best friends. So my wife, uh, when I couldn't be there, she took care of the house. Uh, I was with my mother a lot. The sad thing was sometimes when the dementia set in, she thought people were harming her. So I had to put video cameras in. I had to really be proactive. Uh, I mean, when I couldn't be there, sometimes I was there. It was very frustrating because she was either sick or very worried. And, you know, uh, it just it's hard to see that. So I would hold her hand. I would try and comfort her, but I didn't have an answer, you know. So we kept going to doctors. We kept trying different. She also had fibromyalgia. She also had dystonia, which is the curling of the toes. So it was really like one thing after another. It was like you take a nail and a hammer. Every time I saw some light, it would just be shut. And, uh, you know, even one morning we thought, because she had half of her face started drooping one morning. I thought she had a stroke, but she didn't. But, you know, and then she started losing her voice. And as it got further, and Parkinson's has five stages, which I didn't even know. And the worst stage is the last one. But you don't know how long it'll last. It was a year. But the last seven days of her life were something I can never describe because she only had a heartbeat and didn't even, she had no abilities. And state, I'm in Florida and they're trying to change the laws, but we don't have death with dignity. So it was just like torture seeing them give her morphine and that didn't help. Uh, and she was just really like lifeless. And those again are the moments you have to talk about so we can really tackle these tough topics like end of life. But a lot of people I noticed don't even want to deal with it. But if you don't plan, like she was amazing. She had a will, she had her whole funeral plan. Again, we didn't expect her to pass, but at least it was done. I can't imagine having to do those things, you know, when you're in mourning. And I actually just posted my speech I gave, which was, I've spoken a lot of my life, but that was the toughest one ever. I put it up on my social media. I have every social media. I don't know why, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just put it up the other day. And, you know, we don't share it for sadness or grief. We share it to show how important this topic is. And I wish more people like you would, uh, you know, give a few moments on it. So, again, I thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your story. You know, I had a former coworker. I think her father recently passed from Sorry. Parkinson's. And then there's another colleague. I think he was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's. And, you know, it's, I can't, it's undescribable. It's just, you know, it's like that. It's a harsh reality. And it's like you have to deal with what life gives you. And, um, um one of the other problems with Parkinson's is where you were ex your expertise is it also causes other things like, you know, depression, mm -hmm. uh, emotional, emotional changes, difficulty. Like my mother had with swallowing. There was a point where she couldn't even eat anymore. Uh, speech changes, big problem, which we don't talk about is the urinary problem, like constipation. We had to have nurses 24 seven. I don't know if it was the medicines, obviously it probably was, but that was a big issue. Also sleep problems. Uh, the dementia, the muscle cramps, dystonia, and then the list just doesn't end. You know, it's sad. Yeah. Um. I guess how are you still dealing with grief, George? Or like, how how would you describe that right now? I think that's an incredible question. I wish uh, that's why I love doing these because some people ask things like that, and it just makes it different. Like, oh, I don't want to do. The, these things if it's just the same thing you know but that question is important what do i do i think together for sharon is really the only thing that keeps me going i did a podcast recently and it was fine i was all okay went in the other room and just i'm six two 200 pound police <laughs> i went in the other room saw my wife and started crying because you know this stuff is not easy to talk about uh so it's still i'm still grieving i think that support group we're going to start my help I never really got to talk to people like you who also lost a loved one but due to cancer because I think, again, we have, sadly, a lot more in common than we realize. But I think doing Together for Sharon is important. I just happened to pull up. I don't know if you can see, but so today, mm -hmm. uh, today I'm Jack Waller. And this is crazy, but I interviewed him from Parkinson's 
Nova Scotia. <laughs> so like I said, I mean, I love it. I mean, I, I've been able to reach people around the world. The Parkinson's and advocacy, again, is not just about the U.S. anymore, but it's really an incredible coalition. And uh, there's just many groups out there, like someone called PD Avengers, who bring everyone together around the world to try to bring awareness. So I think what helps me with grief is meeting, inspiring people like you, your audience, and uh, really knowing that someday I hope I'll be able to stop when we find a cure. That would be great. Um, yeah, hopefully I can find a cure for pancreatic cancer because yeah. that's, you know, when my that's, dad, that's how my dad died, and that has a um, poor prognosis. And also, you know, I, I don't want to be... I try and bring a little positivity, but, you know, I'm a realist and I can still get Parkinson's. So anyone can. So we don't, they don't think it's genetics. I feel it's more pesticides. My mother lived in a nice place, but really didn't know. She didn't keep it up for 10 years. So it was like nice on the outside, but inside she had had termites, uh, different mold, all that stuff. And the stuff they spray back then, who knows what the heck that was. I really feel that that's a big cause also dieting. Uh, my mother was good with that, but, you know, fitness, it's very important to do 45 minutes of fitness we're learning, no matter what you have. It's, mm -hmm. it's again, slows down the neurodegenerative disease, and there's just so many things now I learned that, I don't know if my mother, she has, like, this really cool machine where you can use your hand, but mm -hmm. at some point, it just got too tough. Even physical therapy stopped, because she just couldn't do it. Are you her only child, or did you have siblings to help out? I have one brother, but unfortunately he had his own, you know, life and things. So he tried, but it was more, I was like the big brother, the caretaker. My mother was divorced, so she didn't have, a, you know, I look at some people who have husbands and I admire them and nothing against her or my father, but I think it's incredible. Maybe I would have taken some of the burden off me, but I knew he, she wasn't there and she didn't have anyone. So I really had to step up as a man or a son or either you have to do things and you never want to regret. I mean, if I look back, we didn't put her in a home. I'm very proud of that. And there were some days I told my wife I can't, I couldn't do anymore. Like I tried everything. I failed at everything. I felt, I know we didn't fail, but we tried. And we tried getting a medical marijuana license. That didn't really help at all because uh, the distilleries, it was new in Florida. Distilleries don't speak to the doctor, so it was kind of chaos. Like no one knew what to take, what to amount. Uh, so we tried like a pill, but either she fell over in the wheelchair from too much or made her delusions and hallucinations work. So, you know, I'm glad we tried it. I'm for that, for people suffering, end of life for sure. But, uh, you know, these things like medical marijuana, end of life, are very important topics that I don't see people talking about. And I even wanted to interview a few, and they just, it's weird. There's a fame, I don't want to bash anyone, and I'm not, but the famous organization called Death with Dignity, and I wanted to kind of show, talk about them. And they just wouldn't, they didn't want to, I don't know how you're going to get things passed or have awareness if you're not going to jump on with everyone and work together. So. Yeah, I think a lot of us are just in denial and not comfortable with that topic. Because yeah. I know even for me, when my dad, like before he passed, I transferred him into hospice. Yeah. And I think that was the hardest decision for me because I'm like, oh my goodness, like, yeah. this is it. <laughs> um, well, but so I another but I'm just so happy that I did do that because, you know, he was more comfortable. He had staff around him. Yeah. Um, so I have no regrets about that. Um, I wish I would have done it maybe a little bit sooner, but. Right. That's the thing we always, you know, look back, uh, wonder. I still wonder today, like a big problem with Parkinson's is diagnosing it properly. There are also other illnesses and diseases that look like Parkinson's but are not. So if you get misdiagnosed and take the wrong medicine, that's life threatening. Uh, so things that I also think today, like writing my book, I wonder, the only question I would have had for my mother, is, did she really understand Parkinson's and because she didn't talk, she had it for 15 years. It only, she had a little trouble, like stiff in her arm, but she could live, she could drive and it never affected her until the last four years. She went for a special uh, research study in uh, another uh, university and I have nothing against anyone because they tried, but we think they changed her medication too drastically. And when she came home that night was the day I had to take over. We found her at 4 a.m. moving out her furniture, and she had some attack, like uh, that she thought someone is inside the house that was going to harm her. So I found her, it was horrifying, I found her at 4 a.m. moving her furniture into the street. And I brought her to the emergency room. They said we saved her life. 
But when I went back to our house, I always tell the story. You know, post-it notes where we write notes? Well, she had them around her room, and it had names of people who were deceased, so she knew who was really in the room and who wasn't. And that was really like the most heartbreaking memory I have throughout my whole life is that one night because I really just felt like, you know, lost, helpless, and just didn't know who to turn to or where. And that was when my journey started because that's when I had to really step in. She was put in like a home for just a week for rehab, but she was never the same after that. We had to have round-the-clock care. Uh, she just uh, felt terrible. And also I had another tough day was taking away her car keys because she, you know, that was when you take away your independence from someone, but I did it because it was a danger to herself and others. But that was like one of the toughest days like uh, I'll ever remember in my life. Yeah, you know, as a um, caregiver, it's like you have to make hard decisions. Uh, um, but of course, it's, you know, for the safety of your loved one. Did you ever seek a therapist or ever got help for yourself while dealing with all of this? Because that's very uh, tough. That's another good question. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I actually had a, I went to, it's called Morse Life. They had like a free person on the phone that worked too much. And we spoke a few times, but thankfully, because of my wife, I feel like I didn't really need anybody. I did try a year ago again. It was with a younger psychologist, but you know, it's weird when it's, no offense, but when it's a stranger, it's not the same to me. So thank God again, I have my wife. She's really someone uh, who helps me and she like allow, approves me of doing all this because she even jokes that some, you know, this hour I'll be with the family, but I'm busy doing advocacy because it really means a lot to me. I'll do it f forever until they find a cure. But uh, also even meeting Michael J. Fox, I'm going to draw my life for a day or two. Usually I wouldn't be able to do that, but she was a re she was the one who said, let's do it. So things like that, the support, uh, that means the world to me. And that's what got me, even gets me through today. Well, that's good. Sounds like you have great support. Yeah. That's always helpful because when you're, you know, a caregiver taking care of, you know, a loved one that's very sick, it could cause a lot of stress, as I mentioned, and yeah. it could take a toll on you. But you had a lot of help, and it seems like you're very resilient. You're turning your pain into purpose, and you're really advocating and sharing awareness. So this is so awesome, George. And again, um, can you just tell our listeners what your website is if they want to help out? It's www.together for Sharon. It's all spelled out like F O R Sharon.com. And you'll have a lot of fun there. I mean, it's a sad story, but it's an inspiring one. You'll see all the uh, uh, all the media I've done in like TV news, all that. We have our own blog now. We have uh, support groups. We have ways to. I do walk. So every year we have the Parkinson's Foundation walk. And the American Parkinson disease. I don't know why the balloons are flying. It was actually good. It was good timing. I learned my daughter told me they're better at, I guess if you move your finger the wrong way, like weird images show up. It was, oh, actually, never... it was good timing because I'm talking about the walk. So we're at the walk, we'll have a little table and we'll hand out. I'm scared to put my hand, but we have these bands in memory of my mother. We give them for free. And uh, it's nice because it's funny sometimes. Like the saddest thing about this is people sometimes wonder why I'm doing it because I don't want anything in return. I just want a cure. And uh, so we'll have a table, and we're in the middle of all these pharmaceutical companies who are selling things. But sometimes people are scared to come over, but, uh, but then when they realize what we're doing, we had a gentleman in a wheelchair. He, had an, uh, um, he was a veteran. He couldn't speak anymore. He had Parkinson's, but his wife came over with him, and they started crying, thanking us for, for what we're doing. And that's really why we do it. Uh, but on the website, you'll see that. You also see uh, uh, I, we partnered with a lot of organizations. So you'll see all the other organizations. One great one is Drive for a Cure. They actually uh, do race car driving and they raise awareness for Parkinson. Uh, also, Power over Parkinson. So there's so many of them out there. It's really just a matter of which one you uh, viewers might be interested in. Uh, also, you'll see our story and uh, just some other uh, research. I, was lucky enough to, we added a section called researchers and scientists, and I was able to, uh, I don't know if you can see. I see. It, I was actually somehow able to get some of the top scientists and researchers in the world with Parkinson's from Germany to all over the world, and they actually did interviews with me, so you can find that there. And that's really cool because they get to, they talk about the future, what, you know, changes are coming what studies are being done and how closer we can become to a cure for Parkinson's. 
Wow, this is amazing. How do, are you able to reach out to all these people? I don't sleep. Like, it's really, and that's the thing. Together for Sharon is just me. There's nobody else. So people sometimes, they think we're an or like a found big thing. We're not. It's just me. It's somebody who lost their loved one, mother. And I just swore to myself in my heart that I'll never give up. Because I don't want other people I've become, like, family with to have to struggle and go through Parkinson's disease. And, you know, that's the most uh, disheartening part is while we're sitting here, people are, you know, suffering, and I don't want that. So I have to keep fighting. On days I feel burnt out, you know, I post a lot of the days I just don't want to do it anymore. And then I see one of my friends posting about, you know, the shaking, tremors, and it just makes me want to go more. And then I actually have a lot of things planned. The book I'm praying will come out this year. And then I have, I'm going to release in two parts all the interviews we've done in a book two parts and i want to do a children's book for my kids because i feel even today they don't understand what happened to their grandmother and i had trouble explaining it and then i have a big one i'm planning and since i'm in law enforcement and in the legal system i want to change the whole united states and awareness for police and for emergency managers i want them to be more aware We've, we don't, I taught at the police account, there's not a word about the word Parkinson's at all. And I'm not blaming police, and this is not a blame game. This is just a awareness game. And I want them to change their laws, the uh, standard operating procedures in every department in the U.S. to include Parkinson's. There's a story I heard out there. A gentleman was driving, and he was late at night, got pulled over for speeding. Well, when the officer came to the window, he was shaking, not from fear, not from drinking, not from alcohol, but for tremors, for Parkinson's. They had no clue what it was. So he had to explain it. Thankfully, it ended, you know, peacefully. But something like that, you know, I'm an officer late at night. I don't know what's going on. They could be drunk or they could be uh, drugs. They could be harmful. They could be reaching for a weapon. I have no clue. If I'm not trained properly, that's going to end very badly in the news. And I never want that to happen. So there's a lot of things. Uh, I just need more time. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Um, Just educating the police. Yeah. We all need education, even for yeah. me. Um, yeah. I don't have that much exposure with Parkinson's. I do work in the mental health field, so I'm more... Well, you, sound like, you sound like you actually have more than a lot of people, which is great. So, I, you know, I appreciate that. Because you said, even describing it, a lot of people I speak to just are completely lost. And I guess not their fault. I didn't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I didn't know what the heck, I had no clue what Parkinson's was, even when my mother had it till the fourth year, like the fourth year till she passed. So she had it for 11 years. I didn't care. And it's not even that I didn't care. I didn't, she never really showed any major issues of life changes. But the second her whole life crumbled, like in a way slowly, that's when I took over and learned everything. But you know, I wish if I was talking to a George, younger George, that didn't know anything, I wish I could have had what, you know, the support I built now. And uh, I don't think it would have changed much. Maybe the fitness could have changed, like slowed it down. But again, when my mother passed, there were four huge bag, garbage bags of medicines. And I don't know to this day if the nurses gave the right amount, if the caregiver support was giving the right, they kept the journal, but it was a, you know, I tell you like trusting so many people with your mother's life. I wish she had lived with us. We just bought a big house this uh, year ago, and uh, there's a room in the corner, which was her room. So even now, when I came to her interview, I passed that room, and I, you know, part of me feels horrifying. She never made it to us, but the other part is inspires me when we speak that you know she's still alive because of us and what we're doing, keeping her memory alive. That's nice. So before we end, um, George, I like. I guess my guest to share three gems or advice to those who either is struggling with Parkinson's or who has a family member with Parkinson's or who just know someone who is just dealing with a lot of pain. What are some advice or gems you'll share for those who are just struggling and, you know, don't really see light at the end of the tunnel? I have a little statement I always say, but before I get to that, I, I just want them to know they're never alone. You got to reach out. There's people out there like me, but if you don't reach out, you might never know about it. And also be inspired because there's other people going through it. And that's why, again, I, the crazy thing is I, I literally make no money and I do not want a damn dime. I have to be frank, <laughs> even though I'm George, that joke. <laughs> but I don't want anything. And people are shocked when I say that, but I want you to go to Together for Sharon just to a resource. We don't want you to donate if you don't want it. We don't want anything. 
but I, I always end every my podcast and others. Uh, I want to tell everyone that we love you, we support you, and we care about you, and you're never alone. I will advocate for you, and together our voices are so much stronger. And I always say I'm just getting started, but really I'm not. I just like saying that is uh, you know even after this I'm not going to stop. Uh, we have a podcast later, and you know I'm always thinking of ways. I'm always open too to your you and your listeners. If you ever have ideas or things on social media, we have every social media from Instagram to TikTok to Facebook. I don't know how we manage it, but I, you know, I do it. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to also sharing your story because I, this is not just about a little podcast. This, I'm going to add this to my website. I'm going to share it around the world, but I'd love to also, you know, share your journey and your story because I find that I do become like family with everybody that I come in contact with. And again, I'm really grateful to you and your uh, viewers, especially on a Saturday, you took the time out of your life to give me a few moments, and really, it just means the world to me and my family, so thank you so much. You're welcome, and thank you for sharing this and spreading hope and awareness, Um, because a lot of us don't know what Parkinson's is, and, you know, there's just a lot of education and research that's going out towards it, so thank you again, George, and thank you for the amazing work that you and your family are doing to share, um, you know, in memory of your mom. And I know she's looking down, you know, from heaven and just grateful for all the hard work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I always play that Mariah Carey and Boys to Men song. You know, I love it. One Sweet Day. That's one of the uh, ones I, I use that if we had music right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a beautiful song. But George, thank you so much for taking the time thank out you. to be on Find Your Resilience. Listeners, if you want to support George, his website is www.togethersharing.com. So please share um, to those that, you know, who may be suffering um, with the disease. But thank you, George, again for everything you've, you're doing. Thank you all. And have a great weekend. And I hope to see you in the future. And keep an eye, everyone. Reach out to your local senators because the National Plan to End Parkinson's Disease has a lot of urgency and it's going to save lives and really end this disease forever. So thank you again. Thank you.